Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher, author, filmmaker, and the founder of Impeak. My guest on today's podcast is Debbie Soon, co-founder of The Hog, a Web3 company she is building together with Randy Zuckerberg. The Hog has a very interesting business model, which comprises of an accelerator for NFT projects, as well as now an NFT review platform. This was such a refreshing conversation, and it felt like a mini course in all things Web3. I hope you enjoy. So, uh, Debbie, you work with Randy Zuckerberg very closely and, you know, you are uh, partners at The Hawk and uh, you've been working together for how long? Can you tell me a little bit about the story of what is The Hawk? Um, you know, what you guys, and I say that as a Hawk holder, by the way, I have six of your NFTs. Actually, I think I just uh, gifted two of them to one of my colleagues. So I love what you're doing. But for our audience, do you want to explain a little bit about yeah. what the hog is, how you started working with Randy and where you guys are taking it? Yeah, absolutely. So we like to call ourselves at Hug Web3's friendliest community of creators and curators. Uh, we really have two main parts of our business. We uh, run a number of accelerator programs for our creators. So we're currently mentoring about 27 different NFT projects and founders. And on the other side, we are building a review platform for NFTs. So kind of a customer discovery platform for um, community discovery platform for NFTs. So think of it like your Google business, your Rotten Tomatoes, uh, but essentially for NFTs. And I started working with Randy from Feb 1. So I guess about five months ago, um, and I met her not too long before that. We actually met on Discord, so before this year, um, we did not know each other, and we met in the Discord server of another NFT community. That's so fascinating. Which was which was the NFT community where you met? Uh, yeah, we met in the Meta Angels, uh, in the Meta Angels NFT community, and this was before Meta Angels uh, started minting, but uh, yeah, like I was actually building a different startup all of last year, and then made the decision to, you know, close it down at the start of the year. Uh, and then after that, you know, really kind of had, you know, basically was in a situation where I could really do anything that I wanted. And then after that, decided to kind of go into Web3 full time, uh, started putting some feels out, you know, like hadn't, hadn't officially worked in Web3 before, but, you know, had all of these skills. And I was just looking for, you know, the next startup that I could get involved in and then put something out in Meta Angels, and then Randy Zuckerberg basically uh, replied to that message that I posted, and then we got onto a Zoom call a couple of days later, and then less than two weeks later, we were uh, building and co-founding Hug. That's amazing. That's what. Uh, that's such a uh, fantastic story. I have. Uh, I have to say, like I've met some of the most um, amazing people on Discord, and I was for a very long time. I was really, um, you know, resisting the idea of uh, Discord because I thought, you know, this is going to be so time consuming. It's yet another, you know, medium. And, um, you know, uh, I, I'm so glad that I actually got into this court. Uh, and then I ended up buying a lot of different NFTs. At the moment, my most favorite Discord channel is um, Proof, uh, you know, because I, I, I like the quality of people, you know, the, the connections, that the friendships really, you know, you build some amazing friendships and um, a, a lot of other uh, communities as well. So, um, okay, so the hawk, uh, you said that it's basically the business model has got two things. So there's that accelerator part and there is the review part. So let's um, get into the review part for a bit because that's very interesting. I would love to know how you are tackling it because there's so many uh, things that are coming out, you know, constantly. It's a very, very difficult job reviewing NFTs and, and explaining For sure. you know, to people because it, it really depends on what kind of perspective you come to. The truth is that a lot of people buy these NFTs with the hope of the price going up and maybe changing, you know, um, yeah. changing hands and, and um, flipping it, uh, as they say. Then there's also, um, you know, the ones that people buy because they want to uh, get access to something you know, it's a status thing. So right Absolutely. now I'm working with a group of people on the proof um, channel and we are talking about how to evaluate NFTs, you know, like the NFT valuations. And this is something that comes a lot when I'm, you know, 
giving talks at various conferences, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, places like, you know, Morgan Stanley, you know, uh, banks trying to understand these things and, and, and trying to think about uh, from an investment point of view. So what are some of the criteria that you look at when you are reviewing these NFTs? So I think first and foremost, when we started building this platform, our whole, and, and this is across our mission at Hug, really is about supporting creators. And I think in particular, leveling the playing field for creators, regardless of your backgrounds or regardless of your race, your ethnicity, where you're from, your socioeconomic status. Uh, so that's why we always say that our mission is building the inclusivist. And so, yes, I totally, a lot of people are in NFTs because they're looking to make a quick buck. Um, and because of that, the, you know, the entire industry is very speculation and very hype driven. And a lot of the times, you know, there are a lot of high quality projects, unfortunately, are not considered good projects because they just don't have that visibility. And, um, you know, I think the, the not so well kept secret is that in the NFT space, um, there are a lot of influences or whale wallets that can really drive a lot of the attention to one or another collection just because each individual collection is pretty small. So, you know, someone with a lot of money is able to kind of influence how visible a project is. Um, so from, from our perspective, it really is, you know, this is not a review platform to provide financial advice. And, and obviously NFTs are not considered a, a security, but for us, we saw the gap in the market being that there are all of these quantitative trading tools out there, like any kind of, um, at the moment, like NFT trading platform or, or, or toolkit is very focused on quantitative metrics, right? Like, so what is the floor price? Like how many folders there are? What is the volume? Like how thin is the floor? So all of these things that are very geared towards the NFT trader who is hoping to make a quick flip. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, we feel that there is a you know segment of the market or group of collectors that really are just interested in supporting projects that they resonate with. And also appreciating that a lot of NFT projects are really art and community projects. So it is very subjective, right? So if I had um, an NFT project that was in particular very passionate about like automotive culture or like car culture, but I'm not like a car person, that that could be, that could have a certain value to it. But I as an individual would not value it in any way because I'm just not part of that subculture. And so for us building this review platform, it was really about how can we provide qualitative research and qualitative feedback that people could share with one another. And so for anybody that's looking for their next NFT project or community to get into, uh, they will be able to go onto our platform and surface some of these more qualitative information. So for example, we have filters that allow you to filter project by the founder attributes. So if I'm looking to support a fellow Asian founder or I'm very passionate about Asian culture, and heritage, I'll be able to find Asian founded um, projects, or likewise, if I wanted to support LGBTQ founded projects or projects that have an LGBTQ cause, um, I'll be able to filter that, right? So we have filters by founder attributes, we have filters by mission and causes as well. So, um, you know, if I'm passionate about sustainability, those are some that those are the filters that I would go into and find projects in which that I resonate with. And then similarly, on the review side of things, um, rather than it being you know, um, this is going to make you money or whatever, uh, we make sure that every single review has two open-ended fields where we ask every user to, to review, this project may be for you if, you know, fill in the blanks, or this project may not be for you if fill in the blanks, right? And I think a lot of it is just appreciating that in the NFT space, it is it can be that it is subjective and it's really just like any kind of art form. Like um, even when we talk about movies, um, maybe I like romantic comedies and I, I just don't really want to think when I'm watching a movie. And so that to me could be a really good movie, but somebody else may find that movie really awful and trashy and not worth their time. So, you know, I think that's what we really focus on in terms of bringing these projects to light. And then when you ask about how we look at projects, Another thing that we have as well are compliments. So kind of similar to when you take an Uber, when you finish your Uber ride at the end, you can kind of give a compliment to the driver. Maybe he had great music, maybe he had a really clean car, but it was all like different things to kind of highlight what was good about that experience. So similarly for our reviews, we have four different categories where our reviewer will be able to select compliments in which to kind of highlight what is great about that project. And these are in four different categories. So one being the team, um, so we have things like where we describe founders as being um, passionate community builders or, you know, docs and dependable. Um, then we also have 
uh, complements in the in the business slash roadmap um, category, as well as in the community, and then also art, which is you know like I said, very subjective. So you know we feel very um, confident about what we're building, and that is very differentiated from what else is out there. Obviously, there's still going to be a place for quantitative tools, but we feel what is really lacking in the market is for people to be able to discover these projects without necessarily having that pressure of like, is this project going to go out, go down? Because, you know, at the end of the day, like we want to encourage people to discover these amazing communities and these amazing businesses that are being built. That's fascinating. That's really, really interesting what you're trying to do here. So then um, who does the writing? Uh, is it going to be mostly by you? Like, how are you going to manage it as the NFT space keeps expanding? Yeah, so at the moment, we are going to um, open beta access to um, a, a group of our community members from Mixed Meet. Um, currently, all of the information is community source. So um, anything, there are some things where like the founder attributes, it's not something that you could get off OpenSea. So all of these things, or even the mint date, that's not something that you can, I mean, you can kind of pull it off from Etherscan, but it's still a pretty laborious process. So a lot of this data uh, and even things like roadmap categories have all been community source. We also wanted to make sure that every single description of the project would be easy to understand. So for that, we have a team of uh, writers that uh, have been putting things together. And then I have been personally kind of going in there to make sure that everything syncs up and looks um, and looks okay. Uh, definitely, the, I would say we intend to keep the bulk of the projects on the platform community source and community research with like kind of a final, um, kind of a final moderation or final moderation layer just to make sure that everything, you know, there's no grammatical errors, there's no spelling errors and all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at the moment, the beta has around 300 projects. Um, and so the aim is obviously to get to um, as many projects as possible. But right now, our focus is on really showcasing both high quality projects or projects that would be considered quote unquote blue chip, as well as projects um, that are featuring creators from marginalized communities. So like representation is very important to us. So making sure um, there is sufficient representation across you know, all different kinds of founders. Uh, but yeah, I think the aim is to obviously keep adding more and more projects. And so um, that's gonna be a challenge for sure as we start trying to involve the community into greater uh, amounts of moderation going forward. Amazing. So how do you, how are you going to keep this updated? Because there is, a, so, this space moves so fast and there is a constant changes. Like for example, we were going to be releasing um, an NFT, uh, you know, collection that was going to be, um, you know, female PFPs. And then we were going to mm -hmm. have like a, another one that would be male PFPs and we wanted to you know work on like pairing this together and like create this uh, concept of allyship but when we started doing so much more research and and you know looking at the market product market fit um, and especially after I joined Proof I, I learned lots of things from being in that community that um, you know that I just decided to drop that whole idea. Um, so like so, and sometimes um, you know I, and we've already created the NFT. So now I'm thinking about you know we will shelf that and we'll do something with it down the line. But like not um, we're not going to do something with it right now. So I, I wonder you know obviously not everybody's going to have a massive change to that degree, but things change. You know come uh, you know maybe a community is built and then the roadmap changes, there are pivots, there's like lots of things that happen. Um, how will you keep track of those things? Are you going to be using uh, artificial intelligence? Um, or is this going to be like something like Wikipedia, where people uh, are going to help, uh, you know, just a general public can come in and, and help? Yeah, I mean, I think Wikipedia is probably a great reference. So I think it'll be a mix of both. I think um, so for every project page, um, the community will have the opportunity to flag if something is inaccurate. Um, obviously, there will need to be a layer of editorial. So, you know, we'll probably at some point have to hire like an editor in chief to make sure to kind of have a system of going through all the projects. Uh, but we also would want us, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Yelp, but in Yelp or even in Google, actually, you can claim your business, right? So um, similarly, like when you have a restaurant listing on Google, maybe your opening hours change uh, or, and you, you're extending it, shortening it, whatever. 
Um, but when a business claims that listing as they are, they are listing, they'll then be able to go in and make changes to it directly. So we'll be looking to add some of those capabilities along the way. But yeah, I think definitely we foresee this going forward as very much um, community driven. You know, we really want to empower the community to uh, you know, be able to take charge of their research that they see while at the same time making sure we have um, good moderation practices in place. And I guess the thing that I haven't mentioned is that we really intend for this to be completely tokenized in the future. So right now, I think if you look at Google reviews, typically uh, reviews in general, typically people only leave reviews either if they had like a really good experience or if they had a really bad experience, right? If you had like just an average experience, you're probably not going to go in because you don't feel the strong emotional um, connection to want to leave a review. Uh, and then the other thing that we've been seeing in the industry, this is just more broadly speaking, is that a lot of businesses actually pay for fake reviews. So you could even go onto Google right now and say, I want to buy like a thousand five-star reviews to put on Amazon or something. Uh, so, you know, at, at the moment, and it's really hard to see whether, how authentic this review is, right? Like somebody being paid for this review or similar to like influencers, just this business paying somebody to write a favorable, favorable review. So for us, we believe that people should be rewarded and um, incentivized to make high quality contributions in terms of these reviews. So at the moment, we're very focused on making sure that the platform itself is easy to use. So rather than kind of like diving into Web3 right away, making sure that we have a good product market fit just from a Web2 side of things, and it's starting to add on these Web3 components, right? So people will be rewarded for being able to point out that oh, there is an error and that they kind of went in and they made changes to it. So, um, and and then creating, giving greater utility to these tokens along the way, whatever that may be, you know, exchanging for allow list spots, um, you know, all sorts of other things that, um, or even pushing out projects or upvoting projects so they get um, more prominence on, on the main page. So these are some of the things that we've been looking at um, to really kind of lean into this Web3 ethos where, you know, everyone is playing a part and they can, have ownership of all the contributions that they're making. This is really cool. I like the tokenization model. Tell me if I'm wrong, but am I understanding it correctly? Let's say, for example, I have a Moonbird. So first of all, I need to prove that I have a Moonbird. So probably I need to connect my wallet. And then as a Moonbird holder, I can go to the Hog ecosystem and uh, leave a review about my experience as a, you know, a community member of Moonbirds. And then I get tokens um, for, for from the hog for uh, providing that review. Is that right? Yeah, and I mean, I th we're going to let anybody, like, so you don't have to be a Moonbirds holder to review the Moonbird project, but obviously if the Moonbirds, um, if you have a Moonbird next to your name, it will show that you're a holder. So I think what this does is that it's very transparent whether someone has a vested interest. All, all, people can draw whatever conclusions that they that they want to draw from, you know, say the reviewer being a Moonbird holder or not, right? Like on one hand, it could be you're very, you know very well um, exactly like what it's like to be a Moonbird holder and can speak more um, accurately about the experience. On the other hand, or you could be somebody who's just trying to pump your own bags, right? So, but I think at least that information is there versus, you know, right now, like I could pretend to review a movie, but I've actually not watched a movie before. And that's not something that you can verify, but obviously this is why we're very excited to start with NFTs because of the blockchain and you have that layer of transparency. I love that. That's great. Like, um, because then it makes a big difference um, because I was initially going to say, like, if you're not in a community, how can you potentially provide, um, you know, review because you haven't been in it. But I see that, for example, somebody might talk about the fact that it's not accessible or, you know. Like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, so this is uh, super, I, I can see that this is very helpful for the um, NFT community. Um, and uh, you said that you also have a an accelerator. Do you see um, any kind of... Um, I guess conflict of interest is not the right word, but like, you know, uh, if you have uh, companies that you are uh, helping as an accelerator, would they get some form of preference in these reviews or uh, how, how do you make sure that, you know, you are as a, as a platform, uh, you know, that this side of the review side of things is separate and different from, you know, the accelerator side. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think so the selection process for the accelerator is, com is done completely differently. But um, on the on the platform, we do intend to highlight that this project is part of the accelerator program. So we do give things like little badges, like to say that, hey, this is a project that went through our accelerator. So for example, Boss Beauties is a project that uh, went through our accelerator. So they get like a little badge to show that they're uh, affiliated with us. Uh, so again, it is about kind of having that that transparency, but obviously the reviews can come from anyone, right? Like we're not, and you can see who wrote the review. So we're not gonna go there and be, oh, this project is great. Um, you know, obviously we accepted them through our accelerator, there is some form of endorsement there, uh, but you know, all of the reviews should, you know, ideally come from the uh, community, should come from the uh, the rest of the rest of the web tree who has been, you know, observing what they have been uh, building. I mean, I think going forward though, there probably is more opportunity to drive synergies between um, two parts of the business. And I think that more from a community standpoint. So for example, we have a, a couple of projects that we are, um, that are in our accelerator right now. Um, so having the opportunity for them to have private um, ask me anything like AMAs within our Discord community, allowing our community to get to know them better, um, you know, kind of having these more like alpha like discussions, but, you know, really with the, perspective of understanding these founders better. Uh, so, you know, I think there's interesting ways that we can continue to drive synergies between them, but at the same time, still keeping the selection process for the accelerator, you know, very impartial. Um, and as well on the review side of things, still keeping that um, very fair and as open to the community as possible. Fantastic. Yeah, I love it. So let's talk a little bit about the accelerator. So what's the business model there? And what is, um, because for example, I have uh, the air hug, I have the tree hug. So you need to have an air hug to go through, uh, you know, this process, right? Um, so tell me a little bit about what's the business model there in terms of how do you monetize, you know, how do you uh, work with these companies or communities that you put through your accelerator? Yeah, so we uh, essentially charge a percentage of mint proceeds. So, uh, so essentially as an advisory fee. Uh, so we we that's that's basically how we monetize. Sometimes we provide additional services as well in terms of technical services. Um, as we have our own full time um dev team, so we would charge um for those it would be like a flat fee depending on you know how um intense or how intense the work is. Uh, but yeah, we work very closely with. I mean, as part of the accelerator, they all get one on one office hours with like Randy and myself, and then they get taken through like a curriculum. And then it's obviously that network effect right now. So right now we have 27 projects that we work with. So, you know, they can kind of go through this entire experience together, you know, be able to foster collaboration and partnerships really easily. Very nice. Um, so in that sense, it's a little bit similar to uh, Meta Angels. And I know that you do a lot of collaboration together, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, uh, fantastic. So uh, what's the next in your roadmap? So uh, right now, like how, how many people are working on the hug, um, at both sides? And, uh, you know, where are you going with it? Uh, you know, how big do you think like the accelerator is it going to keep growing? Yeah. Or are you going to keep it quite, you know, selected and smaller kind of groups? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, um, at the moment, I would say that we're definitely going to keep, um, you know, having more accelerator cohorts, but we are probably reducing the frequency. So we have done quite a few cohorts since we started in February. Um, hence, we got to 27 projects in like less than six months. Uh, but I think what we have been noticing is that projects actually need um, more of our help over a longer period of time. So previously, for some projects we were only working with for about three to four weeks, but I think we've been realizing that, especially given markets right now, like um, projects want to work with us over an extended period of time. So I think what's likely going to happen is that we'll reduce cohorts to kind of once every quarter. Um, and then, so which gives us the opportunity to work with projects, like I said, over a longer period of time and maybe, you know, fewer projects each time. So we can really kind of amp up the support that we're giving them. Um, and then in terms of what else is on our roadmap, obviously, like I said, we are, uh, rolling out the beta, um, like a like a smaller beta, kind of from next week onwards, and then a month after that is when we're going to be start opening it up to the public, um, where um, anyone from the public can just access the homepage. But in order to access, you know, um, to see full product details and everything, you'll need to own a hug NFT. And then we'll be adding more and more capabilities to the platform over time. So, like I mentioned, tokenization that will probably come next year. But starting from this year, we're going to do more of like off chain tokens like off-chain points if you will so kind of still like a web 2 model but really starting to test um 
the economy that we're building and making sure that the incentive structures are all in place before we actually introduce an actual token. So want to make sure that people are finding this uh, process engaging before we kind of start introducing that kind of financial incentive and, co and complexity around that. Very nice. So um, how do you feel about the market right now? You were in New York. Did you feel that the interest was waning in, in any way or were, were people just as excited about NFTs as before? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, in New York, when there's so many people that's gathering together, there's obviously a lot of excitement, there's a lot of euphoria, um, and it was really great to see the community come together in person. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how things pan out once that excitement has kind of died down. I think, in general, there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, people are really happy to be a part of, like, the NFT communities that they're in. But, you know, obviously, we're still in a bear market, like, no one's really going to know, like, how long this is going to um, to, to, to go on for. Um, and, you know, I don't even know what is the next big kind of NFT event or meetup. So, you know, I think from between NFT and NYC and then I think it'll be interesting to kind of see how things pan out. Um, you know, also understanding that, uh, you know, and I'm very realistic about this because like I said, I, I closed on a business of my own, like at the start of the year. So, you know, it's, it's hard to see like, you know, how many projects will, you know, kind of continue to survive throughout um, this bear market. And so, you know, I think it's just about who really is here to build for the long term, who has um, good, you know, financial discipline, good capital management, um, and yeah. being able to kind of survive through this this um, this period. What would you say to some of the companies that, whether the ones that you have already helped get through um, your accelerator and other people who are building right now? Uh, what what would be your your advice for entrepreneurs building in this space right now? Um, you know, I would say, so I, I've, and I've, I've written about this before. So, you know, um, I found out my first startup back in 2014, and that was a um, boutique indoor cycling studio. So that was very capital intensive, where I had to pay the security deposit for the, for the, the rent. Um, I had to buy the bike. So I had to make a lot of investment up front. So uh, I had to, you know, basically took out of my savings, the, the capital that was going to put aside into this business. And then it, it was months before I would even see that first revenue kind of come in. And so because of that, I had to be very like, you know, financially disciplined and working within a budget because that was, you know, all the money that I had. I think a lot of NFT projects, they in some ways kind of have the opposite um, problem where, you know, if you have a successful mint, maybe you have like a million dollars from like day one, which is like completely unheard of. And, and obviously you're working with contractors or like developers or artists that you promise to pay but typically these are done as a percentage of your mint so you're like a okay, great like you know you don't really have too much upfront um capital out in time and so i think as a result you know especially during the bull market people have been perhaps not the most financially disciplined like and i, and I get that it's great to set aside a certain amount of capital to go into charity or to, you know, I don't know, throw like some fancy like community event just because you have that million dollars in the bank. But then, and then with the expectation that your secondary royalties are going to be a stream of passive income that's going to keep happening, right? Um, but, you know, and as we now know, it's not really the case. I think just even on the industry levels, the volumes have just um, dried up. Obviously, there's still some projects that are very heavily traded, but for the most part, um, you know, most projects, you know, don't have the luxury of having like that much of an income stream from secondary royalties. Uh, so, you know, my, in general, my advice is always to be, um, you know, be, be financially disciplined. So how much, you know, understanding what your cash needs are, how much of a runway do you have? Like, do you have at least 12 months? Like, um, and, and if not, like, what are you going to do about it? And like, how are you going to think about other ways to um, generate revenue other than from secondary royalties? So, um, I think it's just having to, you know, encouraging founders to kind of think, um, you know, outside the box because we are still so new and NFTs are continuing to evolve. So, you know, like a year ago, you could probably mint a project and then you would have, I mean, either both from a founder perspective as well as a collective perspective, um, you know, like they could just, uh, you could, you almost guaranteed to make it, right? Like a high probability of like making it or being successful. But now like um, the demand side of the market is more saturated than it was before. So um, I think there have been more projects coming to market than there have been more people coming into NFTs for the first time. So it's like, how do you really differentiate? Like if you're just providing art and community and having a 10,000 piece collection, that may not be good enough. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this has been a very eye-opening. I really enjoyed hearing about your uh, business model. That's that's really, really interesting, both on the accelerator side and uh, the review side that you're building. So um, super interesting. And I really appreciate you sharing it with me. Yeah, of course. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Debbie soon. Be sure to follow her on Twitter and keep an eye out for what they're building at The Hug. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show.